Well, good morning to everybody that's here. We welcome you to Antioch Missionary Baptist Church. We still have a few members that don't really feel safe coming just yet. We pray that soon this will be over and everyone can feel relaxed enough to come back to church. Monday, tomorrow, is Memorial Day, and this is one reason I wore this shirt. These are superheroes, Spider-Man, Hulk, Superman, but my most greatest hero of all is Christ Jesus, and he is saying, and this is how I saved the world. He died on the cross to take away our sins. And for a memorial in that respect, he was only in the grave three days and he arose, but he did die on a cross to take away our sins. And for that, I'm truly grateful. And he now sits at the right-hand throne of God making intercession for you and I. So when we say a prayer to God, he interprets it to the Heavenly Father. And I've often thought sometimes when I get through with a prayer, well, I think about something that maybe I left out or I wish I'd have said in my prayer, but I feel like he knows what's in my heart, so therefore when he does present it to the Father, it's the perfect prayer that I wish I had have prayed. And that's marvelous in its own self. <clears throat> this morning, if you have your Bibles, turn with me in Revelations chapter 22, and I want to read verse 17 through 21. <clears throat> and the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Now last Sunday, I believe it was, when we talked about how Jesus came to Jacob's well, and he asked the Samaritan woman, to give him drink, and she said, well, why would a Jew ask a Samaritan, because we don't get along, and he said, well, if you'd known uh, the kind of water I'm talking of, you would never thirst again, and he wasn't talking about our physical water, he was talking about the spiritual water that's in us, or our spiritual life. And he says here in verse 18, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. That's a pretty strong statement. If you add anything to God's word, he'll add the plagues that are mentioned in the book to that person. Verse 19 says, If any man shall take away from the words of the book of the, his prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So he's telling us very plainly, don't take anything out of God's word. Don't add anything to God's word. And that's what my subject is really about today. He which testify these things say, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Has our world gotten to the point where Christians are saying, Lord, come quickly? I include that into my prayer pretty frequently now. I'm ready for the return of our Lord and Savior to take his bride, which is his church, to be with him forever and ever. If you have your Bibles, turn with me in Genesis chapter 4. <coughs> and we want to read... Verses 1 and 2. Genesis 4, 1 and 2. And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And again she bare 
his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And we know the story how that when they made a sacrifice, Abel brought a blood sacrifice, and Cain brought a harvest sacrifice. Well, for God to accept the sacrifice, it has to be a blood sacrifice. And he became jealous that Abel uh, uh, was able to uh, have blessings from God on his sacrifice, so Cain killed his brother. Early, early, early in the history of the Bible, there was a murder, and it was brother killing a brother. Now, isn't that a horrible fault? But here I wanted us to recognize what he said here in verse 1, that Adam knew Eve. That means they had a relationship that would conceive a child. He knew her in that way. And if you will turn with me over in uh, Genesis 19, 1 through 14. Genesis 19, 1 through 14. And there came two angels to Sodom at Eve, and Lot sat at the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. We know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and how God destroyed it because of their evilness. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray, unto your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early, and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. These two angels that came to Lot's city of Sodom, said, no, we're not going to come stay in your house tonight. We're going to see what's out there on the streets. And if you see how Lot was encouraging them to come into his house quickly and stay all night, but then get up and leave real early because he knew what kind of sin was going on in Sodom. And he says, and he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned into him and entered into his house, and he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house around, both young and old, all the people from every quarter. So there was quite a gathering around Lot's house. And look what their intent was. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out to us that we may know them. Homosexuality. Bring them out that we may know them. Just like Adam knew Eve, they're saying, let us get to know these men. And when Lot went at the door unto them and shut the door after him and said, I pray ye, brethren, do not so wickedly. He knew what their intents were. He knew what their thoughts were. He lived in that city. He knew what was going on in that city, yet he stayed in that city. And he says, Behold now, I have two daughters which have not known man. In other words, I got two virgin daughters. And he says unto them, I pray you, bring them out to you, and you do to them as good as your eyes, only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. 
I cannot understand Lot willing to give his two virgin daughters over to this kind of public. I would certainly never have ever suggested that I would give Amanda in that fashion. But he did because he was still trying to protect the two angels that came into his household that very night. And they said, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow came into sojourn and he will needs a judge. Now will, we will deal. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to breaking the door. They were to the point of almost breaking the door down to get in there to get these two men or two angels but the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness. These angels put blindness on their eyes. They couldn't see. Both small and great, so that they worried themselves to find the door. They couldn't even find their way around after this blindness came upon them. Now, I want to tell you this. I have heard TV evangelists say, oh, I don't, I don't support homosexuality in any form or fashion, but I would never preach against it because it might offend someone in my congregation. So what is he doing? He's leaving out part of the Word of God. What did we read in Revelations 22? Don't add anything to it, but don't leave anything out. And they're leaving it out when they don't preach that this is a sin in God's eyes. This doesn't mean that God doesn't love a homosexual. It simply means He don't love their sin. And I'm not a homosexual, but I have committed sins that God doesn't love about me. But by believing in Christ Jesus, a lot of my sins have been forgiven and I have become a changed man in the way I look at things in life. And for a preacher to say he won't preach against it in his church, he's leaving out part of God's word that should be preached in every church. Verse 12. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou any besides son-in-laws and thy sons and thy daughters and whosoever thou hast in the city, bring them forth out of this place? He had other children. They wasn't living under his roof anymore. Only his two virgin daughters were. But they had already left the household but they were still in the vicinity of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says, For we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spake unto his son-in-law, which married his daughters. So these are not the two virgins, it's other daughters up get ye out of this place for the Lord will destroy this city but he seems as one that mocketh unto his son-in-law they did not take him seriously part of the coronavirus today could very well be God's way of saying wake up let me get your attention you're not living a godly life today and it's not just in America, it's worldwide. So to say a preacher would say, I don't want to offend anybody, so I'm not going to preach it. I don't think God is well pleased with his pastorship or his message. It's not taught enough in churches today as it ought to be. 
and worse, homosexuality, which I've already told you I, I've never done that. And, that, and that's far from me in other ways I have sinned. And in God's eyes, sin is sin. And I've had to ask for forgiveness of other things besides homosexuality, but there are other sins that I've committed that I need to ask God forgiveness of. And as long as I'm here on this earth, from time to time, I know I will sin because I am human and I'm flesh. And Paul said, in us lives the spirit and the physical, and they war against one another. And that's what we all experience. The flesh wanting to do this, but the spirit says we should not. If you will, go with me over into Revelations 21. And I want to start in verse 10. And here he's describing a whole lot of what heaven looks like. And in each layer, and there are 12 layers in heaven, there's precious stones. Some of them I know how to pronounce, and some of them I've tried to get people to give, give me some help on pronouncing these names. And I may not hit them dead on, but we're going to do our best. In 22, Revelations 22, what? 21, I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah, 21. I've already read in 22. Starting in verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit into a great high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was likened unto a stone most precious, even like jasper stone, clear as crystal. And he had great walls, and it high and twelve gates, and the gates twelve angels named written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the east were three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of that city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. We've already studied this before, but uh, it's a city built four square. And for however many cubics, it would be like going from the uh, Atlantic Ocean all the way over into Colorado, about 1,200 miles. That's how big the square was each that long that wide that high 12,000 12,000 by 12,000 verse 15 says and he that talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof and the city layeth four square the length as as large as a breadth, and the measure of the city with the reed, twelve thousand furlongs. The length of the breadth and the height are all equal. And he measured the wall thereof, and a hundred and forty and four cubics according to the measure of a man that is of the angel. Now here's where we get into naming the different kinds of precious stones for all 12 layers. And the foundation of the wall, wait, I'll, I'll back up 18. And the building of the wall was as jasper. And the city was pure gold, likened unto pure glass. Transparent gold. I've never seen that but we're going to. He says in verse 19, And the foundations 
of the wall were garnished with all manners of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper. The second was sapphire. The third was chalcedony. I'm not sure I'm saying that right, but I'm taking a stab at it. And he says then, uh, the fourth was an emerald. The fifth was Sidoniax. The sixth was Sardis. The seventh, Christiolite. The eighth, Beryl. The ninth was Topaz. The tenth was, uh, let's see how you say that. Chrysopyrus. <clears throat> Where did I leave off? On what verse was that? 20. And the twelfth gates were, uh, the twelfth was Amdius, and um, I left out 11, which was Genesis. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gates was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold as it were transparent glass. Wow. <clears throat> he tells us that in this temple, therein was the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are in the temple of it. Now, I said all that to say this. I've heard preachers preach that God has built for us a room or a dwelling place. I got a room where I live, and I've told you this before, <laughs> but I've never lived in anything this precious. This is a mansion, folks. God has prepared for you a mansion not made with hands, so any preacher that changes what I've just read to you as just a dwelling place, he's leaving out the important description of what heaven is going to be like. You add to it, or you leave out anything, yeah, I don't think that pleases God one bit. And I'm not going to stand here and tell you you're going to have a dwelling place in heaven or you're going to have a room in heaven. I'm telling you from God's word, you have a mansion in heaven. And we just read that all 12 layers is of a different precious stone, pearl gates that are one pearl. I mean, a pearl is a small thing, but imagine the whole gate being as one pearl. Transparent gold, I've not ever seen that before. A tree that bears 12 different fruits in a year and a river of life that flows through it. Now tell me, have you got a dwelling place? Have you got a room? Or have you got a mansion? Got a mansion. It troubles me that preachers don't preach God's word as it ought to be preached throughout our land, throughout our world, as it should be from the very beginning. I don't try to take God's word and twist it around to mean what I want it to because some of the times what God's word says, I step on my own toes. But it's the truth. And I need to hear it. And you need to hear it. And the whole world needs to hear it. That's part of the problem that we have in the world today. We've gotten soft on the scripture to where it's just a room or a dwelling place. Or I'm not going to preach on homosexuality because I don't want to offend anyone. Sin is sin in God's eyes. 
If you will, turn with me in John chapter 14. I usually have a book marker, but my book marker wants to fell out. <laughs> John chapter 14, verse 2. He simply, this is Christ speaking. He says, In my Father's house are many mansions, not rooms, not dwelling places. He says, In my Father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Someday, Christ is coming to take every child of God to a mansion that we shall live in for a while or till the rent is due. No, we're going to live there forever and forever and forever. I hope some of the message that I brought to people today will realize that we have to stick to God's word. One other thing I want to bring in, a lot of churches today practice infant baptism. To be baptized as a baby, you don't even remember your baptism. And it started about 130 years to 202 years after Christ that they began to practice infant baptism. Jesus wasn't baptized till he was 30 years old. Why well, all of a sudden do you feel like you got to baptize a baby? Baptism isn't what gets you into heaven. It's believing in Christ Jesus as your personal Savior. Baptism represents the death, the burial in the water, and the resurrection of Christ. It symbolizes what Christ went through. And as a child, you have absolutely no memory of that. But as an adult, you do. So we got churches out there today that practice infant baptism that is unscriptural. Show me anywhere in God's word that we're supposed to baptize them when they're just a baby. And they have no remembrance of it. And you won't show it to me because it's not in there. 